Okay, the recording going. All right, so your co-host. So if if my internet goes out or something and I disappear, this meeting will stay open, and you should be able to share your screen. Okay. But we're gonna go live over to Facebook. So if you're ready, we'll get started. Okay. <laughs> Let me get get us started on Facebook first. All right, let me try this one more time. All right, good afternoon. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us. Today Today for our artist talk with uh, All right. good Lady afternoon. Long Soldier. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us. Sorry, I forgot to mute that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I'd like to introduce our, our artist today. Uh, this is uh, Oglala Lakota artist, Laylee Long Soldier. Um, Laylee, I'll, I'll let you take it away. Okay. <laughs> Well, that was a quick transition and um, I'm, I'm suddenly shy, but I feel also very, very happy and very grateful um, to be here with you. I'm, um, I'm zooming in from um, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm actually at, on the UNM campus, University of New Mexico campus right now. Um, but I'm just, I'm so excited to be with you. Um, and I wish I could see, I wish I could be there in person and I wish I could see all of you, but um, I am gonna just trust that we are all here and uh, ready to go. Um, and I also want to apologize ahead of time. I'm a little awkward on Zoom, <laughs> so. Uh, I'm going to do my best here. Okay. Um, I think that I'm going to jump in right into, I'm going to do screen share uh, and share a project. Uh, it was a little bit hard to decide what project to do to share with you and talk about today. Um, but I decided to share some work that I made in the last year. Um, and this particular piece I wanted to share with you because um, if you want to, you can actually go across the street to uh, Oglala Lakota art space um, from the college. You can go over there and you can actually see the piece that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and I also, so I thought that would be fun for you after I talk about it, then uh, if you're ever over there, you can take a look at it. Um, and the other reason I wanted to share this piece today too is because it is what I would call a hybrid piece. So um, I have some, uh, an essay, prose writing, I have poetry, I have photographs and I have an actual, um, art piece, a, a physical uh, visual piece. Um, so there's all of that happening. And I wanted to share it with, with the students, uh, with, with all of you, um, just to sort of um, open you up to possibility. Because I know that maybe some of you enjoy making things, uh, you work visually, maybe some of you are interested in writing, you're writing now. But I wanted you to maybe be open to the fact that you can do all of it, um, you know, 
uh, there's no conflict. Uh, there's also, there's a kind of unity in all of it, uh, a, a possibility for that. So um, I'm gonna start. Um, I'm gonna start, I hope that this is okay with you, but I'm gonna start with a reading first. So it requires a little patience, but I'm gonna share screen so you can follow along with the text. So uh, the reading will take a while. It'll take maybe 20, 30 minutes. And after the reading, if you can be patient, there's gonna be photographs and all kinds of stuff. And I will talk about, uh, after the reading, I wanna talk a bit about the process of making, what went into it, um, some of the thinking and some of the uh, resources and people I turned to. Um, as I was making this work. Okay, thank you. That's just an intro and I'm gonna um, try to share screen now. Let's see if I can do this. Hmm. Oh, wait. Sorry, one second. <laughs> okay, hold on. All right. How's that? You guys got it? Yep, we can see it. Great. And just so you know, um, when I'm reading, uh, I can't see the chat bar or anything. So if you need to get my attention at all, um, just uh, you'll need to um, um, just uh, get my attention uh, verbally, <laughs> unmute and, and uh, feel free to um, say something. Uh, so I'm gonna start off by reading from this piece uh, that was published in a journal called The Offing. And so uh, because of time, I will not be able to read the whole piece. So that's why I just wanted to uh, share the actual um, site that it's published on so that if you want to go back and read the whole thing uh, in its entirety, you can find it here at the offing. Um, it begins, it, it, it's an essay, uh, what you would call an essay, I would say it's essay-ish, <laughs> it's a hybrid essay um, and it's in two parts. So the first part, part one is uh, all text. Um, part two, we move into uh, poetry and photographs. So that, that is also a hybrid piece. Um, so I'm gonna summarize the first part of this essay due to time. So uh, the title is Now You Will Listen. And I've read this piece several at several events over the last year, um, but today this is a little different. I will read the work, but um, what makes today different is that um, I'm sharing a lot of what went into making the work. And I felt also some of the students uh, there at the college, you may even, um, I mean, we share a kind of history and there may be certain relatives um, that are mentioned or what have you. So um, we'll talk about some of that uh, in a little bit. But it's titled, Now You Will Listen, um, Trust Issues with American Schools and the Care of Our Native Children. Um, so this, this essay was really born um, born out of a, a difficult situation that happened at my kids' school. Um, we live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So uh, my child was attending a school where there were only a few Native students. So the majority were non-Native, non-Native faculty, non-Native um, peers and classmates. And there were some really um, upsetting and difficult uh, things that happened at that school last year. 
needless to say, uh, my kid is transferred to a native school this year <laughs> here in Albuquerque and is much happier. But um, at this school, uh, there were some upset, upsetting things that happened with um, that had to do with language used in the classroom uh, and assignments uh, that the native students had a, uh, were, were upset about. And the biggest uh, issue I think was that when my child spoke up, my teenager spoke up and said something, um, um, it was not really, I don't think really heard and addressed in the way that we needed it to be. So, um, and so I titled this, Now You Will Listen. This was my opportunity in my own way to speak as a parent and, um, and, and have them listen. <laughs> I suppose, listen by reading, you know. Um, so the first part of this essay summarizes what happened. Uh, what, you know, my kid wrote this paper, there was a lot of backlash uh, in, this, in the classroom and in the school. Um, and it was really sort of emotional, um, very, very upsetting. Uh, my kid did go through a, a bit of depression at that time and so on. Uh, very emotional, as I said here. Um, and I and I discuss in the essay some language that was used to discuss colonialism and imperialism, which was really upsetting for the native students in the classroom, and so on. So uh, I don't want to read the whole thing. It's actually kind of intense and um, hard for me to read to step back into that place. Uh, and then here I talk about uh, some of the community members, another native mother and uh, one of the students, um, you know, um, some of the things that we talked about during that time together. And then here I talk about, I write about uh, a video uh, that I watched by Faith Spotted Eagle who has, in her background, she uh, has, I think, um, education or training in um, trauma work, work working with uh, various communities in healing trauma, but she's also a very strong advocate for Native rights. And in this video, she talks about the need for us to be able to tell our stories. Um, so uh, it's, she writes, uh, or she says, uh, when we talk about these losses and traumas, it's important since the student body that will be watching this is native and non-native. And it's important that when we talk about this, it is not to impart a sense of guilt. It is to impart a sense of freedom from denial. So when you look at that trauma response, this is Faith Spotted Eagle talking. Uh, when you look at that trauma response and the native people's objective, the native people's objective is to heal. The non-native people's objective is to come out of denial. And when these folks can come out of denial and these ones can start to heal, then we start to come together on common ground. Um, so, I included that in this essay and in my the the thinking through the think the some of the things I was thinking about at the time. Um, I included that as sort of a preface to where I'm going to start right now with you. So what happened was I went to the office at my kids' high school and I had to deal with um, the principal, the administration. And ultimately, you know, to find out what was going on. And ultimately, I offered uh, to, to come to the school myself um, and give uh, uh, visit three of their classes and give a presentation on um, colonialism, colonization, imperialism from Native perspective. Uh, I thought that that might be important. And I wanted to do it not for them, 
but actually for the native students there in the classrooms, just to have them feel a sense of uh, presence from other um, adults in the community. So I came and of course I can't cover the entirety of colonization or imperialism. <laughs> so I chose to focus in on boarding schools um, since that was sort of um, present on my mind at the time. So I'm gonna start there with, with the lecture that I prepared to um, give at the high school and man, just even summarizing it took a lot of time, but we'll start here and I'm gonna start reading. And as I said, hang in there with me uh, because this does get, uh, part two does switch into visuals and we'll start uh, to think about um, making things um, in, in uh, at the same time as writing and all kinds of stuff, so. Um, Uh, here we go. When I visit my kids' high school uh, next week to discuss colonization, I, I can't believe this. I found a little typo this morning. <laughs> but anyway, that should say colonization, um, specifically boarding schools. I'll note that this process, uh, this process of child internment and cultural erasure is not unique to the U.S. at all. Uh, it's been implemented world over wherever Europeans sought to take land and build, quote, empires. It's a systemic method uh, for mentally, spiritually, and emotionally destroying the original people of those lands. So this didn't just happen here in the U.S. It's happened in many, many um, places, you know, around the globe, really. I'll also emphasize that the boarding, the quote boarding school era is not something of the past done and gone. I'll discuss the ways in which we continue to feel the effects in present day uh, community and family. I'll begin my presentation by showing Faith Spotted Eagle's uh, short video as a window into why it's important for us to tell our stories. I hope to spark the non-native students' desire for freedom from denial, quote, freedom from denial, their interest in listening, creating space for native students to speak their stories and perspectives comfortably in these classrooms here on their land. Then I'll share a little uh, of our history using photos and documents from the boarding school era. Importantly, I'll emphasize that when I say, quote, our history, I really do mean our, both native and non-native, uh, meaning this is not native history alone, certainly not. Anyone who lives on this land is a treaty inheritor, thus accountable to the methods by which this land was seized. These methods are why an American can live happily, for example, seated in a recliner inside a 2,500 square foot home with a golden Labrador and a mammoth trampoline purchased from Costco, saluting the sun in their grassy backyard. Americans of all backgrounds must acknowledge General Richard Pratt, the mind behind US boarding schools as an ancestor in main maintaining control over the original people of this land that Americans now occupy. Pratt, a bricklayer, a grave digger for this grand spacious American lifestyle. Uh, as I collect materials, I realize that my presentation will be history heavy. Uh, numerous names, dates, and sites. I shrink, worrying that the students' minds will wander 
just as mine did in high school. Uh, I wouldn't blame them but it's important to me that they understand our history as relevant to the moment we're in, meaning the past has not passed. Um, it's fundamentally present. We might understand this idea, I'll explain, at the, lang uh, at the level of language, <clears throat> which informs how we process, speak of, and form our realities. So um, that is actually how I started talking to the high school students. I talked to them a little bit about um, concept conceptually how we understand reality um, through language. So I, I gave them an example. Lakota ver for example, Lakota verb tenses differ from English. Lakota language has two verb tenses versus three in English. Um, the future is one verb tense. So a lot of you already know this. And, um, but anyway, the future is one verb tense. Some language teachers refer to this as potential. It's the potential uh, tense, um, the future. And then the past and the present together uh, form another tense. So that's the second tense. And this is sometimes referred to as realized, so that's the realized uh, verb tense. Uh, in other words, past and present are forever unified and intertwined. This is reality for Lakota people. Um, in preparation, I've looked for a handwritten letter that I saw posted on social media. Um, I wanna share this with the students. Uh, it was written by Sichangu Lakota leaders, White Thunder and Swift Bear in 1880, um, begging the Commission of Indian Affairs for the return, um, the return of their children's remains from Carlisle Indian School. Though it's unthinkable, their request was denied. Um, I see uh, someone's hand raised, is that correct? From Carolyn's iPhone? Oh, maybe not. Uh, if, if anyone needs to say something or interrupt, feel free. Um, I can always pause, it's okay. Um, so uh, White Thunder and Swift Bear wrote a letter to the Indian of uh, the, the Commission of Indian Affairs and asked for their children's remains to be returned and that request was denied. So I wanted to share this with the high school students. Um, I asked my friends on Facebook if anybody knew of this letter. I had seen it, but I couldn't find it. And a friend messaged me a PDF of this letter within minutes. At first glance, um, I didn't think this PDF was what I was looking for. I remembered reading a line that said, uh, we will continue singing until they return. That's what I remembered from that letter. Um, those words of mourning felt etched within me. I messaged my friend back to say, thank you. Um, but I didn't think this was the right letter because I didn't see those words. Um, but it turns out that in fact, it is the letter I was looking for. Um, what Swift Bear and White Thunder actually wrote was, quote, our hearts will grieve too long if we don't have what's left of them, our children back. Uh, we want to dig their graves with our own hands. We wait when the birds begin to sing and the flowers begin uh, to bloom. This, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> this expression of grief from White Thunder and Swift Bear is far more potent um, than what I remembered. Um, yet, it's interesting that I remembered their words as, quote, we will continue singing until they are returned. I don't know why I remembered it that way. Um, but indeed, we, we do continue to sing 
for our little ancestors, uh, the return of their remains to their homelands. We continue to sing for strength, for comfort we sing, to be heard, you heard me. We continue and continue as it has been, it is now, this way of feeling endlessly. Um, to thread our past to the present, uh, I'll tell the high school students about recent events, uh, rooted in history, but freshly grieved. Some months ago, the remains of 215 children at Kamloops Indian Residential School in Canada were discovered. That news hit us with a crushing wave, an earthquake really, because the loss of the past is experienced presently then and now as one and the same. Meaning our little ancestors are still our children today, if that makes sense. Since that first discovery at Kamloops, the number of children's remains detected at Canadian um, residential schools has by some counts exceeded 10,000. So they started taking that radar and going to different um, residential schools, and they've only done a fraction of those schools, and it's already over 10,000 now. Uh, as this process has only recently begun, I assume that this number will multiply exponentially. I await the day when radar detection uh, begins here in the U.S. on the grounds of American boarding schools. I imagine a national trembling in this potential. But would Americans really tremble at such discoveries? This is a question that doesn't need answering. That I am compelled to ask is the answer itself. And so really, you know, I, I do wonder, if, you know, if they found, um, if they made similar discoveries here, would anyone be shocked? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there would be any kind of um, public dialogue or um, acknowledgement, you know, I think uh, it's something I think about. Um, <clears throat> just two months after the discovery at Kamloops in July 2021, the remains of nine Lakota children were returned from Carlisle Indian Boarding School in um, Pennsylvania to their homelands on Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. Uh, so I'm sure that um, a lot of, this is why I wanted to share this essay with all of you because um, you know I'm sure you were around when um, this happened. This was um, July of last year, last, not last summer, but the summer before. It took seven or eight years of research and negotiations to arrange this. <clears throat> My kid and I were visiting our relatives on Pine Ridge. So we were fortunate enough to be able to join the Sichangu uh, community for their funeral and honoring. Um, the day before we went to the funeral for our little ancestors on Rosebud, however, my child expressed hesitation. We had just attended a funeral for my young niece earlier that week. Um, it was heartbreaking and an indescribable ache filled us. Um, at the wake, the cries of her three-year-old daughter, you know, cut through the air and we had to excuse ourselves and walk outside. Uh, it was very, very emotional. So um, it's no wonder that my kid was reluctant to attend another funeral um, so soon after. Um, but my intuition told me that the observance for our little ancestors would be different. Um, I told my kid there would be many families, um, many families there, many relatives from different places, prayer and songs, stories, um, speakers protocol. 
so there are ways of handling this kind of grief. And I knew that each step would be arranged with great care. Um, and just as I believed it would be, it was. Um, the day was powerful, um, but it was not traumatic. We were held together in the strongest ways of our past. This is why I'm sure those ways are present. When I visit the high school uh, next week, I'll share the names of those Lakota children, ages 10 to 18, for whom we rose to our feet, prayed, shared stories, and offered gifts. Um, so I'm going to read those um, nine names. Um, Dora Herpipe, um, Brave Bull, and I'm sure a lot of you are either related or maybe you, you know um, some of these families. Um, Dennis Strikes First, Blue Tomahawk, uh, Rose Longface, Little Hawk, uh, Lucy Take the Tail, Pretty Eagle, uh, Warren Painter, Bear Paint Dirt, Ernest Knocks Off, White Thunder, uh, Maud Little Girl, Swift Bear, Friend Hollow Horn Bear. Uh, oh, Alvin. Roaster, also called Kill Seven Horses and One That Kills Seven Horses. So I'll ask the high school students to look at the list again and notice the family names in parentheses next to Ernest Noxoff and Maud Little Girl. So we'll go back up, Ernest Noxoff and Maud Little Girl. You'll see White Thunder and Swift Bear. I'll remind them that these are the names of the Sichangu leaders who pleaded desperately to have their children's bodies returned in 1880. Uh, these two fathers who wrote, quote, our hearts will grieve too long if we don't have what's left of them. If there's time, I'll inform the students that White Thunder and Swift Bear were among the 135 native leaders who signed the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, uh, which bound them to agree that, quote, in order to ensure the civilization of the Indians entering this treaty, the necessity of education is admitted. So these two fathers actually had signed that agreement um, and they therefore pledged themselves to comp uh, compel their children male and female between the ages of six and 16 to attend school. What grief and devastation White Thunder and Swift Bear signed their names to. Uh, signed, may I remind you, with X's. So we, uh, we should understand this treaty as nothing less than what it was. Uh, seizure, forced seizure of land and hostage of our children. What better way to enforce our leaders' compliance when their children's lives were at stake? And we're almost at the end of the first part. These are hard facts for uh, non-native high school students and faculty to embrace, I know yet they are common everyday truths for Native students. Necessary truths to understand why the wound, why the fierce pushback against the S word and R word. You can uh, read more about that in the beginning of the essay. Why we rise to our feet and sing for our little ancestors return. Why our relatives dig and place them in their rightful graves with their own hands. Why we sing for their fathers and mothers now long gone, for their families still here. Why we continue to sing for our children today who walk the halls of these institutions, who sit obediently under fluorescent lights, Listen to and absorb language spoken in contexts 
they did not choose. Why, uh, where the past isn't braided gently, but knotted, tangled into their minds as daily endurance. In closing, I'll admit to the students, to be honest, my kid and I are not known as singers. I can't say we really sing at all. It's more like softly humming along when we have to. Our real singing is different. Uh, we make things. So I'll end by sharing visual work that my kid and I made uh, collaboratively. This was how um, we expressed our feelings this last year. Since it's an art school, I hope the students will appreciate this. Um, I'll talk about form, my favorite thing, a shape, a safe hold for structure, a territory, a house, so to speak. So we speak. Um, so that's part one and I'm going to switch now to um, Um, I'm going to read part two, but I put part two on, um, what you call it, PowerPoint. I put it on PowerPoint because it made it look a little better than reading it on the, on the journal, the online journal. So I'm going to do that. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Let's see here. Okay. All right, can you see that? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, I cannot believe how quickly time goes, you guys. I'm dying. I have so much to share, but let's see how far we can get. <laughs> this is crazy. It just goes too fast. I could just do this all day. Okay. I may have to forego the, the last part and open it up to questions, but... um. We'll see how far I can get. Um, so let's see, let's do a slideshow. Does that work? Yes? Yep. Okay, so part two is titled Metamorphosis. And I'm going to have to do this here. Okay, great. All right. Um, so, as I said, part two is a hybrid of uh, written work. This is what we would call, you know, um, this is like a little prose block. It's a poem in a sense. Uh, so we have some poetry and then we'll move into some photographs and um, visual work. Uh, when we first heard about the discovery of 215 children's remains found at Kamloops Indian Residential School in Canada, you know, my child and I were rocked. Our faces flattened into paper maps, pockmarked by countless X's. All those child internment schools and our little ancestors. It felt strange as a mother to look toward the passenger seat of our car and encounter a 500 years sadness along my child's sweet mouth. All of us, our relatives, native friends, and colleagues were shaken and rocked, shaken and rocked. We rode a seismic tremor through this land. Did you feel it? Three of my relatives could not speak about the subject. As in, they said, I can't talk about it. And their eyes watered with our words instead. To this, I am witness. I am supposed to be a person with a command of language, yet I refuse to command anything at moments like this, as this, this is a hanging crystal, at each edge sharper feeling. Rage glints from this point, and as the crystal twirls, grief flashes next to crippling loss. Do you know that crystals are formed by slow, pressured, magmatic metamorphosis? I want to remind my relatives that the crystal's metamorphic essence is thus its greatest 
but I cannot say it. The word commands me to respect its privacy, protect its strength. What can I write anyway? What words have any? When a Milky Way of accounts have already been spoken, written, and prayed. Among the many, our beloved ancestor, Zint Kalasha, wrote about her um, boarding school days. And when I read her pages, I read a story we already know. These accounts run like veins in the crystal of our land's bedrock. So, uh, someone threw up the curtains, Zint Kalasha wrote, and the room was filled with sudden light. What caused them to stoop and look under the bed, I do not know. I remember being dragged out, though I resisted by kicking and scratching wildly. In spite of myself, I was carried downstairs and tied fast in a chair, <clears throat> tied fast in a chair. I cried aloud, shaking my head all the while until I felt the cold blades, the scissors against my neck and heard them gnaw off one of my thick braids. Then I lost my spirit. Uh, if you guys have not read Zint Kalasha, I highly recommend uh, her work. Um, she's one of our earliest uh, writers um, and just someone that I, I really admire. Suddenly, my child and I, my child and I together, all that of our feelings, what could we do but make? We began to move our hands. Why? I don't know. We began to braid. Why? It is a mystery except we had to. We braided and braided. Our action accumulated. So, you know, at that time when we first heard about um, those children, um, we felt very emotional. It was really like, it was really interesting, you know, um, how powerful that was. And so we didn't know what to do with all of our feelings. And uh, it, it so happens that in my house, I had all these spools of fringe because uh, we use it, we use the fringe to make um, certain things. And um, I just started cutting long, long pieces of fringe and uh, we started braiding them. And as we braided these pieces, um, we thought of, we were thinking, uh, you know, just using that energy, getting our energy out. Um, and also we started thinking about all those little children, you know, at boarding schools, as we know from the stories, the first thing that they did was cut their hair, cut their braids off. And so we started thinking about um, these little braids in that way. We moved our hands along the strands with a firm hold, but gentle touch, quickly yet carefully, as if braiding the hair of a niece or nephew in the morning before school. So there's like a close-up. We kept braiding until 215. So here's like a picture of like, um, you know, a pile, um, all of them together. And then at the top, we started putting these um, silver caps and copper wire because we knew that we were eventually going to um, attach the braids, you know, to, to something. So, um, we started, yeah, um, capping the ends. Then the braids asked for a form to hold them. Oh, and this here is a roll of um, window screen. 
Um, you can get it like at the hardware store. Um, it's aluminum. I think it's aluminum. And it has a very transparent and kind of silvery look. And it's a, actually a material that I use often in some of my visual work. Um, I really love it because you can shape it and mold it. And then we started attaching um, those braids to the end of the, the piece, kind of like a hem. And then you see the form starting to um, take shape. And we're attaching all of those along the edges. Uh, a few mornings, Auntie, my Auntie Tilda came over to help us, us three generations um, making. And you can see it um, taking shape further and further. Our words were unnecessary. It was more important to be together on the land in our. We trusted the process, a gradual metamorphosis of our little braids into. Do you see it? Here you see, um, yeah, it's starting to take shape. And then ultimately you see here, it, it made a wing dress and um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, we had like a copper at the, um, at the edges and then the all 215 were the braids. Uh, I took a little artistic liberty here. This is not exactly um, Lakota style, or I mean, you know, like from, from our area to have, you know, braids attached to the front right there. But um, I took, yeah, I, I did it my own way a little bit, <laughs> but um, I liked it that way. Um, We trusted because we listened. So um, I'm actually not sure how we're doing on time. Okay. We're doing okay. We're doing okay. All right, we're 1248. I'm gonna see how far I get through. Now I'm going to um, lead you in a little bit to the process that some of the, the thinking and the work that went into that essay, the poetry and the visual piece. Um, <clears throat> let's see how far we get. Um, Marty, did you want a few minutes? Did you want me to leave a few minutes for um, questions or how do you want to do that? Yeah, that, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. Do you think we could go a few minutes over time or? I think that would be fine, yeah. Yeah, just a few minutes. I don't want to keep people too long, but if we could have a few extra minutes, that'd be awesome. Um, so I, I may, again, I may not get through all of this. Um, so this is actually, uh, so I titled this, um, let's see here. Oops. Now I want to do, uh, oh well, I want to do like a, is that it? Slideshow? Oh, here we go. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process and uh, I may not get through all of these slides about process because um, I do want to leave a few minutes for questions or conversation or what have you. But um uh, I titled this a year in the making because it actually took me from May 2021 to June 2022. May is when we first heard the news. May 2021 is when all of us um, nationally and internationally heard about Kamloops 
and that's the month that we were really um, shocked and and um, emotional and we started making those braids um the summer of 2021 was uh when they returned the nine Lakota children from Carlisle to Rosebud and then it took me the fall to uh write this essay uh all these things were happening at my kids school at the same time so fall and winter was when I started writing the essay and then spring and summer was when we uh, I got it sub submitted to a journal and then I was working with an editor so all in all you know all of it takes time when we're sort of um, working on some of these projects um, there's something I wanted you guys to think about on uh, two two of these these are two things that I really value in my work and um, things that they're like in some ways they seem um, like opposites but they aren't they're congruent um, and I really think about us having a sense of urgency um, in the in the things that I make um, you know I can't say all of my work is like that but it's definitely uh, it's often a way that I work um, and that is tapping into a kind of electro electrifying energy um, where I'm responding to the moment and the electricity of an event or encounter. And I'm utilizing fearlessness and intelligence to tap into that emotion. So it's really about energy, you know, and I think that when we feel a sense of urgency, uh, like we need to respond, we need to make something, um, our readers or our viewers can feel that energy too. So I think that um, that is something that I try to bring into my work. At the same time, I don't, I, I also think about, I don't want my work to last just as long as the moment does. I want it to endure. So I also aim for a kind of timelessness, if that's possible. And this kind of uh, consistent flow of energy. So the first one is sort of electric. The other one is this kind of um, this flowing energy that's uh, always there. And so what I mean by that is in the work, I, I like to recognize the opportunity to research and learn about culture, history, or an underlying issue. Um, and, and this leads to personal growth. So when I start researching and and um, talking or watching videos or, or talking to relatives or um, re, you know, reading articles and so forth, um, I, I'm growing, you know, I'm learning, I'm growing. And then I also like to engage community, relatives, mentors, or friends to sort of create layered meaning and imbue our art with a power that transcends just personal perspective. So that this leads to sort of a cumulative growth, a, a growth that includes others um, and it includes our family or our community. Okay, I wanted to talk a bit about research and mentorship and I get a little vulnerable on this slide, which is funny, but anyway, uh, I, I was working on this late at night, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, research and mentorship um, is one aspect of um, a lot of the projects that I do, but especially this one. So um, acknowledging um, my collaborators and mentors and citing sources um, is not only a standard ethical practice in my field, but it is also a source of joy. Um, to credit the people who have contributed to my work, either intellectually or through physical labor, makes me feel a part of rather than separate or solitary. Um, I make art, I think, because one, I want to share and to give and, um, you know, I want to contribute something. I want to give something to others. And if I'm totally honest, I make art because two, I want to be loved and understood. 
um, inclusion, collaboration, and connection are vital to my work. When others are willing to share their time and knowledge, um, I am immensely grateful. It makes the work greater than what I could do alone. Remembering that aloneness is the antithesis of my aim as an artist. So um, another part of um, this project and often the way I work is I, I, I like to work with relatives and mentors. So as noted in Metamorphosis, my child and I were stunned by that discovery. And so we had all these feelings, you know, it was really painful. Um, and, and not, and it was surprised, you know, we weren't surprised by what happened. It was painful because it was like a confirmation of what we already knew as a community. So my first collaborator was my teenager, um, Chance Ojitika Alexi White who spent hours and hours braiding the majority of those um, 215 braids um, that found their way onto the final piece. Um, so we tapped into that sense of urgency um, together. Another collaborator relative was um, my aunt um, Tilda who lent her helping hands. Um, to construct our wing dress. Uh, she would come over and she saved our lives by bringing a glue gun, <laughs> which we were trying to figure something out. We couldn't figure it out. Um, and I'd say our time working together was for pleasure. I would say mostly for pleasure rather than necessity. Um, we enjoy each other's company. We like to catch up on what's happened in our lives and so on. So this energy therefore exists within the piece, this, um, this care and this um, affection that we have each other for each other um, uh, is there in that final um, wing dress, you know, that piece that you see. Also, my niece, um, Denise Moveskamp, mentored me in um, historical styles and construction of wing dresses. Uh, I don't sew, so I needed help. Um, so she she was texting me like photos of wing dresses. Um, she made squiggly lines and drawings and was giving me advice. And so she became my teacher and I found great enjoyment in this. Um, this energy is also within the piece. I'm looking at the time here. So I think that I'm going to have to summarize these um, slides so that we have just a few minutes to talk. Um, but I do hear mention the friends, um, community friends, like the mother, um, the friends that were part of this work. Um, and, and I just briefly talk about my, my the ethics um, the ways that I work with, when I mention friends in a written piece, I usually um, show them the piece before it's published and I ask permission, even though I don't use their name. Uh, I wanna make sure that I have represented them correctly um, so that they feel respected and honored. And I'm always willing to correct errors if they see something. Uh, research and citation. Um, I researched our treaty, I researched the children, um, their fathers, Swift Bear and White Thunder, um, Zint Kala Shah's work, I read her work, um, and so on. And I, one of the things I did was I looked at before and after photos of um, some of the children. A lot of you are probably familiar with these photos. This is... Um, um, White Thunder and Swift Bear, by the way, um, if you have not seen their um, pictures before. Who wrote that letter? This is the actual letter that they wrote. So this was a, a part of my research. Um, I also started looking, um, this is an Oglala teepee camp or that you guys have probably seen this picture before in front of um, the boarding school. Um, that the, the families, um, they put up that camp because their children were over there. 
in those buildings. So it's really sort of like powerful. Um, again, about connection, about relationship. Um, at the high school, I shared some photographs of these historical photographs of sort of the um, regalia, the clothing um, of Rosebud. This is from Rosebud from Sechangu. Um, just to give them an idea of um, the work that went in um, during that era that went into some of our um, some of our designs. I mean, this is just incredible, even the horsey has um, on the bridle has that it's um, everything is done with such care and time and here's some of the photo a lot of you guys are probably again familiar with these photos uh, this is a Dines student before and after and what I talked to the students about the high school students is how how our symbol our philosophy our culture is on every aspect of what these students were wearing. And that certainly all of this was a sign of civilization, uh, which was what um, opposite of what the treaty says that they had to go to school to become civilized. So I talked a bit about this um, terminology and its uh, misuse. This is a photograph from, um, the funeral and observance, uh, some of you might've been there. Um, this was in July of last year. And lastly, I discussed the importance of readers and editors um, and how much like my friends, Yasemin Gyasi, Riel Bello, um, two writers, two poets, friends of mine, and the editor, uh, Marlena Gates for that piece. Um, you know, how, how much they also help shape that work. Um, and really, I just close by saying, um, you know, I'm always with others in one way or another when I am um, making. And I think I used all the time and I hate this. I need more time with you. <laughs> but, um, we could We could go so much longer, but I would, we're just a little bit over, but maybe if, what do you want to do, Marty? Do you want to have a few questions? Yeah, or? yeah, please, if you're open to that, I think that'd be great. Of course, I'm here. I could do this all day. So my time is, I'm, I'm yours. <laughs> Thank you. All right, folks, if you have a question, now's a good, a good time to speak up. Or if you'd like to put your question in the chat, I can read it, read it out. I have one. Um, so... Hello, I just wanted to greet you with a heartfelt handshake. And of course, my English name is Tiani Yellowhair. Um, and I've been, uh, since Marty or Mr. Tubles told us that we were going to meet with you over Zoom, I've been thinking of a, a question to ask, and it was actually about this piece. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you covered it. I am. I have an artist studio there at the Ola Art Space. Um, but... My other job is uh, I own a tour guide business on Pine Ridge. And so I bring people um, to the art space. And I've, and since that piece has been in there, um, I have known nothing about it. And I just, uh, until Marty, of course, told us in our class. And um, I really appreciated the piece. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you covered it today. And I had the question, but of course you covered it. So I just wanted to give you a comment that I really appreciate um, the time, the effort, the work a lot of the um, research that went into doing this. Um, and I, I personally would like to see, um, you know, your um, credentials up there and kind of maybe a little bit of what you've done to put into this piece. Um, I know a lot of my visitors that saw it um, had a lot of questions and I just didn't know too much about it. Of course, now I do, but you tell the story so much more meaningful because you're the artist, you and many others. Um, so I really appreciate that, and I and I hope to see there uh, be uh, something to showcase it and to give you that. So I really appreciate that, and Pilame for coming on here. Um, and of course, we would love more time, but uh, thank you very much. You're welcome, and thank you so much for mentioning that because I'm going to be honest. Um, 
I am supposed, I owe them an artist statement. I'm supposed to have an artist statement with that piece. Uh, my friend, Mary Bordeaux reminded me. <laughs> so actually you're making me feel, I need to do that like this weekend, get that done. And so then we can put it next to the piece and then people can know a little bit more. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We have a couple of questions in the chat. The first is, is there a YouTube video of you talking about this whole piece in its entirety that we can watch? I'd like to watch you speak about your essay and, uh, and such more. You have a great speaking voice. If not, would you consider recording a video of yourself talking further about this? <laughs> um, no, I, I don't think there's a YouTube video anywhere. And I don't know. That's an interesting idea. I guess I could make one a YouTube video on my own. That's an interesting idea. I'll think about it. I like that. And then Dana asks, well, where can we see your wing dress again? That was very moving and I appreciate all the studies you have done to spread the awareness about our history. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, it's actually, it's over at Oglala Art Space, that um, building across the street from um, the college over there. Um, do you guys know what I'm talking about? So it's over there. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's over there at Oglala Lakota Art Space. And um, it's inside, um, kind of like, kind of near the entryway. Yeah. Yeah. That's where it's at. I see a thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Um, this is Carolyn Niholi, and I'm with the Lakota Studies Department, and I do use your poetry in my class. So it's really, I did invite some of my students here. I see a couple of them that are here, but I'm really, I'm just so happy to, you know, I mean, even though it's Zoom, I'm so happy to finally meet you. Um, I just had a, um, um, that poem that, that I use is the, while well, the Dakota 38 and also the I think vaporize. So if you can kind of explain what the vaporize po poem was about. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think it's called Vaporative. Oh, yeah. Vaporative. Yeah. Mm -hmm, that's okay. And um, actually, uh, that's a great poem because that poem is about process. If you, you might even call it an ars poetica in, in the sense of like, how or why I write so like the first it's it's a very long piece let me see here how many pages I have my book <laughs> just in case I brought it so it starts on page 23 and it looks like this kind of like a little column down the page and then um it goes one two three four five six seven it's seven pages and so each section is sort of uh, a sort of meditation or consideration on the things that motivate me to write um so for example one of the sections uh i write about um the word uh, opaque which i always thought was uh meant see-through but it means the opposite, actually. It means um, it's, it's um, difficult to see through. <laughs> it means the opposite. And so uh, in this section, I, I write about the sound. It is the sound that's deceptive. Something about the sound of opaque, and I kind of break it down. But um, thank you for asking about that piece. It's really a piece about process, writing process, and um, my way of thinking on working with language. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'd also, if you can, invite you to, to my literature classes as a guest speaker, because I really try to, um, uh, how would you say that, um, bring the local people into the, around the art area. So I would oh. love to. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. We have Xandria asks, 
Are there any other future art pieces or creations to represent the little ancestors that you'll be making? And do you have any more writings or works about it? It was great to read and listen to your writing. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't really have any more at the moment. I haven't been making any more um, visual art or any pieces um, for our ancestors, our little ancestors. I will tell you that that was actually really, um, uh, there was a lot of feeling and emotion. It was intense. So I think maybe I had to, once it was completed, I had to step back from that um, subject for a little while. But I will say, um, I was asked, there's a movie coming out called Lakota Nation versus United States. Um, and the director, um, Jesse Shortbull and the producer, um, asked me if I would write a piece for that film. So if you ever see that documentary film, you'll you'll hear some of my work titled titled um, 135 X's. So that's a new piece that I've been working on, and it's really long and really uh, it's it's huge, <laughs> and I'm trying to revise it right now. But my point is, is um, part of that is looking at the treaty. Um, and, and part of that is looking at the, uh, the agreement to send our children to these boarding schools. But I titled it 135 X's, um, just for all of you, for the students, you know, you can find our treaty online. You can look at the original and if you go to the end of the treaty, you will see that all of our leaders signed that document with an X. And that's one of the things that um, interests me. Like, uh, you know, of course, what does it mean when we sign, sign something with an X? It means we do not speak that, uh, we do not write that language and we cannot read it. So um, um, yeah, that's the closest I've come. To oh, um, this is the film she's talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I've been trying to throw the links in the chat to, to help yeah. supplement the information. I think um, I'm not sure, but I think they sold it to Hulu. Uh, the rights to show it, mm -hmm. and it it'll be on Hulu sometime. I think in the coming year. Cool. Yeah, I've been wanting to check that one out. Just been kind of waiting to see where to watch it. Yeah. Do you have, do you have any other any more questions for Lely? Thank you for all your comments. I see them in the chat bar. Thank you. All right, and just as a quick reminder, everyone, there's a, a short uh, form that if you could help me fill out, it'd be really helpful um, for these artist talks, just, just to get some community feedback and ideas for the next one. So I'll put a, a link back in the chat again, but I'd really appreciate it if you could fill that form out for us. Um, All right, well, if there aren't any more questions, I guess we'll we'll call it. Thank you so much for joining us today, Laylee, and, and sharing your, your work and really a moving, moving experience. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, hope to see you all soon in person. <laughs> all right. Doksha. Doksha. See you.